Hello and welcome back to Buddies Without Organs. I'm Sean and I'm here with Matt and Corey. Hey buddies. Hi buddies. <laughs> How are we all doing tonight, buddies? It's uh, it's nine o'clock on a Saturday, on a Friday night rather. And Matt, you were saying before we started the call that this is in fact the one year anniversary since you did anything at all. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, horrifically. Um, it was the launch of my book, actually. It was a year ago tonight when I saw my dad and a bunch of friends all together in the same place. And yeah, I've just held that in my mind for a year now. That was the last thing that we that that people did that I did. That yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it's that that even just talking about it, my brain melts as I think about how just bizarre that was. Um, yeah, very strange. Lockdown lockdown fatigue is real. Very much feeling yeah. it tonight. <laughs> The last social thing I did was, um, and I think it was the, it was like the Friday, it must have been like the Friday before lockdown, because it was a Monday or a Tuesday when it got locked down. I can't, God, I can't even remember now. It was a but Tuesday. I remember because I, I was at work was, on the Monday. <laughs> I remember as well because I'd taken my laptop, because we would started to be, we were told at work to take our laptops home with us over the weekend in case like it well in case lockdown indeed happened but i remember the very last social thing i did was on the friday night which was going to uh bison beer in uh, in brighton with uh some uh former with some present and former colleagues and i also remember that whole evening was already ruined for me because i had received i'd been cc'd into a very angry email from his worship the chancellor of the diocese of chichester <laughs> pertaining to an illegal piece of building work that the parochial church council Council had authorised at our church, by which we mean we had turned a, a disused storeroom into a little kitchenette to make it easier to make coffees after mass, and that opened up a massive can of very angry diocesan bees, and <laughs> mixing all sorts of metaphors here. But that problem did all eventually go away. But that was also it, it was just yeah, just gave us a very very angry letter in like very weird austere like legal language talking about this so-called kitchenette uh that was my the last thing i had before lockdown was feeling was was being convinced the church of england was going to take to court (laughs) (laughs) Uh, well here in australia our leaders actually well our state leaders actually took the virus seriously so i was out for a curry with some friends just last weekend and god uh, damn it (laughs) Starting to get back to you normal could, here, but it's yeah. It's you still you could weird. have lied. Yeah, yeah, you could have lied to us just now. You know, so oh, it's been as bad it, down in down in the antiquity. I, I respect you both too much to lie. It's <laughs> 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 no, but like I did spend at least six months last year mostly just in my house because um my housemates immune compromised and so I wasn't taking any risks at all. I was yeah very seriously locked down here. Uh, yeah. Yes, well, that's very that's, that is ex- you know exactly the thing to have done. Then, yeah, it's been uh, yeah. I mean, I don't. I mean, uh, I I don't want us to spend too much time on this because this is this is not play. This is not Urbanomic presents Plague Pod. This is Bodies <laughs> Without Organs, and we are um, yes, and we are talking about uh, Deleuze on his own, which is something we've. Um, I'm trying to think, Matt. Have we actually done a standalone Deleuze text? Since we started this, it's all um, been Deleuze and Guattari, hasn't it? I think it has. Uh, Except for the the lost episode on Societies of Control. Yes, yes, yeah, the, the shadow of that was lingering in the back of my head. I was like, I think we have done something, but no, it's, oh, uh, no that I, was it. I was, think- I was thinking about that episode earlier today, actually, and how... And how- irritatingly good that was we will go back to that text at some point we'll keep we'll we'll give it a, a little bit more time maybe we'll come back to that in the summer um because we had that was really damn that was a good one anyway um so we're talking about um the superiority of anglo-american literature which is uh, an essay of deleuze's from dialogues two and of and you know we're going Dialogue to be high. uh <laughs> we are going to be following our normal format here we're going to kick off with some initial uh impressions so before we go on i will sort of like put as a point of warning that uh, we are we were going to record this a week ago 
uh, tonight, but we had to push it back because uh, I um, was vaccinated last uh, Wednesday of last week, which left me in sort of like I was feeling a little bit run down for a few days afterwards. So we had to push it back. But as a result of that, obviously, so now this text has kind of like faintly receded into, I think, all of our memories a little bit. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll see how much we claw back up to the surface. <laughs> um, but yeah, kicking off uh, initial impressions. So one of the things that this, uh, I mean, as is always the case with Deleuze, he covers a lot in a relatively short amount of writing. And in a very real way, like, although this is nominally an essay about literature and about writing, there's not, I'm not going to say there's not too much about either of those things, but they occur in the context of a recapitulation of Deleuze's whole philosophy almost mm. like he, he he brings up like stuff from the logic of sense in here his stuff on like the empiricists and Spinoza which, uh, which if I remember correctly predates difference of repetition and so this is a very an extremely extremely discursive like this is this is Deleuze going over like the whole territory of Gilles Deleuze really in some ways this mm. is this is an essay where he's dealing with and, and I suppose maybe this is actually the whole thing is about writing then in some ways then because this is a lot of this is Deleuze kind of like going over his what he has written about as a philosopher and obviously he, all philosophies kind of primarily exist in the form of writing so I, so uh, so there's oh there's just so much going on here it's so much going on here. But one of the things that did leap out to me, because um, most of the Deleuze I've read is, Del- is Deleuze and Guattari. And, and like we already said, everything we've covered on this podcast up until now has been his uh, collaborations with Guattari. And one of the things that uh, really kind of stood out to me was in comparison with even like the more lucid stuff from capitalism and schizophrenia and in comparison with the stuff in what is philosophy which is quite uh, again quite a clear and lucid text comparatively speaking was that um in contrast to those this is a much easier piece of writing to deal with like you can mm. like i would e- like to even to the extent i'd say but i think this is the thing that i'd recommend you read of Deleuze before anything else just to get an idea of what he's about which does also sort of like i think i was aware of this but that does also kind of like point the finger uh, finger at uh, guattari as being like the source of like the complexity <laughs> and the the like the esotericism uh, that we see in uh capitalism and schizophrenia and especially in the essays in the thousand plateaus so like in comparison with um uh, the geology of morals which we talked about last time which was an impo- almost impossible text to to fully comprehend this was a, a, a real lovely walk in the park <laughs> uh, <laughs> in contrast is very pacey and readable very energetic very vivifying and there's um and what like one of the things that uh, i really liked about this was uh, and i think i don't not i don't want to say too much about this because I, I don't want to set uh, I don't want to step on your toes, Matt, because I know you've got lots you want to say about um, the French, the French in their ways <laughs> at the time. But one of the things, I, one of the things I liked about about one of the things he talks about, which I liked here, was his kind of like condemnation of French literature as it's with its obsess, obsession with secret secret transgressions and the shamefulness embodied therein, in comparison with. And I don't think he does. I don't think he directly makes this particular comparison, but this is the one that stood that came to my mind which is if we were to compare Burroughs and Bataille that um, story of the eye and I saw in your notes Matt that you have like a whole thing there so I'm not going to say too much about it but you know story of the eye one of the things that really stood out to me when we when I read that was for all of its like many inventive transgressions and its acts of violence most of which are sexual or, or sublimated sexually um like the one taboo that Bataille kind of like doesn't like address is uh, is queerness, is is gay sex, which is one well, which really really stood out to me. It's kind of like maybe a testament to sort of like a failure of 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 imagination on his part. If this mm. is a text, is meant to be sort of like the great blasphemy <clears throat> against all standards. <clears throat> like there's a kind of, like it did. It is um, hard to miss that he doesn't. He that this isn't something that happens in it. 
and there's even narrative moments where it felt to me like it would make sense for him to take the text in that direction and this is in contrast for me with with Burroughs if you read something like Naked Lunch which again is similarly uh uh, and more inventively, in my opinion, a, a work of like great transgression and great experimentality, and that's that's full of gaying. Like that, that's that's <laughs> that's wall to wall gaying in places. And the and this is the last thing I'll say about it actually. And and one and and like the general kind of like feeling I have in comparison between so like reading Bataille and reading Burroughs, even though they nominally deal with very similar things or similar themes, is that I get to the end of reading uh, a Burroughs book. And I do feel kind of, I feel energized by the experience. I mm. feel sort of like provoked and I feel kind of like, yeah, I feel good at the end of reading a Burroughs story. Like even if he's dealing with horrible, nasty things, like there's something just like f- fun and joy and joyous in Burroughs. And I, I don't get that from Bataille. I get to the end of reading a Bataille book and I just feel a bit sick. <laughs> <laughs> just like just like a proper kind of like nasty queasiness um yeah so and in those initial impressions uh what what um before we get on to the meat of the podcast what what uh, what initial stuff would you guys like to talk about that you got from this text yeah like as you were saying like it is a really good essay it's like it's packed full of ideas and i think it's actually it means it actually comes through as a bit of a jumbled mess in a lot of ways um i think there's even a line near the end of the essay where um Deleuze sums it up perfectly much by accident um it carries expressions contents states of things and utterances along a zigzag broken line of flight and that's kind of what this essay feels like it's a, a broken line of flight through as you were saying like much of much of Deleuze's um uh, philosophy in previous work um, but yeah, for me, I think the like the weakest part of the essay is probably the the one related to the title, because um, like all the other really interesting ideas, they don't actually rely on that framing, and the framing of you know Anglo American literature versus French literature um, feels weak on its own because it's kind of just based on a lot of generalization. Um, like when he speaks of Anglo-American literature, he only lists 10 authors. And then when it comes to the French literature that he's so intent on deriding, he only mentions a couple of names. Um, so maybe like the contemporary audience for the essay had a better grasp of the context. But for me, it just kind of felt a bit undercooked, that part of it. Um, and yeah, so like with that argument, the best that I could, like the best sense I could make out of it is it's something like, French writers are obsessed with the secret and because of this obsession their works are insular and static whereas Anglo-American literature is obsessed with what Deleuze calls the line of flight which is a movement or a becoming and that's perhaps you know best epitomized by the literal westward expansion that takes up so much space in the American cultural psyche. Um, so yeah from there the, the notions of the line of flight and of becoming uh, become sorry uh, the main thrust of the essay and like that thread is interesting enough on its own that i don't even care about like the french versus uh, anglo-american debate <laughs> one thing that is um and again i won't say much about this because i want to leave uh, lots of space for matt but the um there is like something a little bit maybe um uncomfortable about how he talks about sort of like the american experiment so to speak and you know the upset you know, the obsession with uh crossing frontiers and uh and pursuing those lines of flight and those lines of becoming is that uh he, he does kind of glide over the fact that sort of like the frontiers that are being pushed back were into places where people lived who mm. weren't americans and were there first this is this is where i think uh Deleuze perhaps is Deleuze isn't being a good historical materialist in some parts of this where he kind of like it's kind of skipping over the fact that you know that the american like all these great like like these great lines of flight and these great these great experiments were made possible by the colonialist project and the displacement and extermination yeah. of peoples and cultures that were already there and were doing just fine uh i actually have a, a question for you cory living in uh, uh being an australian is but really like i don't quite sure how to frame this but uh you live in a in a society like that society which yeah, ha- um, and I don't know. I not. I don't want to presume too much about what sort of like Australia's kind of like sense of its sense of its own nationhood is and its and its national mythology. But um, again, a kind of similar thing though. So sort of like Australia's um, 
becoming Australia and and it's uh and it's coming into being again it's kind of predicating this on on the same on the same Ameri- formula as America in fact it, you know it is a, colo- a colonialist enterprise which you know pushes back and destroys cultures and peoples mm. who resided there already in order to allow for the blossoming of a new and distinct culture so I, I'd like I'd like um yeah so I, I don't really know exactly what it is I'm asking there but I did just want to sort of like I uh, wondered if you had thoughts spe- about that question coming from uh yeah well I think I'm not sure exactly how uh, Americans frame it but like in the Australian context it was literally framed as like the continent was terra nullius being empty land and that was the um like there was uh, some kind of like law or decree from uh like the british that they wouldn't just take over land that was previously owned um which of course is a lie <laughs> um, but so they they had to pretend that it was terra nullius and that everything that the indigenous people had been doing here for tens of thousands of years didn't actually matter like just because they didn't build permanent structures in most cases like they just didn't exist and so like that was the fundamental lie that australia is built on and like that lie it's it's still it's only just now in the last couple of years that like mainstream australian media and um like commentators are actually starting to grapple with that and usually that grappling is um pushing back against uh, like indigenous authors uh and indigenous media figures who are actually starting to um you know, have a have a chance to speak up about these you know historical uh, atrocities and so on, and you know, most white Australians just aren't ready to have that conversation yet, and um, so mm. they push back with you know anger and violence. It's, it's similar to something I read about South Africa and about the the um, the Africana myth of nationhood is 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 similar, if not identical. In fact, the assertion mm. that uh, there was no nation and there were no nations in South Africa before the arrival of the Boers, uh, who have then established it because to be a nation is to have have a state and to have farming and agriculture and just as asserting that... Uh, yeah, the if it doesn't look there, like a Western state, then it's not a state. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This, and so, so well, there was, there was no one here, so therefore, which there were, and, so they, and, and yeah, just, just um, yeah, and just, again, just uh, constructing uh, an elaborate false history to to justify it to justify mm. the colonial project um matt do you want to take the lead from here with uh with initial impressions when going into and uh, i have you down first in our schedule so initial yeah. impressions going into your main uh main bit well i kind of it's, i mean it's well i've got a, i have a tangent i know we, i have a i have a plan of what i was thinking i do want to say you don't um, have a tangent you've got a line of flight well, exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I feel like it's uh, you know, it's kind of like before I even follow our own schedule. It's like I, I mean, the topic that we're already on is basically like I should say that, I mean, for me, it's not so much first impressions because I love this essay and I suppose it was kind of my suggestion, um, but I sort of want to own that because I, I mean, I, I love this essay so much and what we're talking about now is precisely why I find it so interesting. Um, this whole the, I mean, and and I'm also going to be slightly even more. And annoying and be the, the guy to say I actually wrote about this in my book a bit um, <laughs> <laughs> which makes me feel like an utter wanker um, but I think it's, it is such a fascinating question because I think there is a way of framing this essay um, as being I mean it's it's not overt and I almost feel like you know because I want I want to defend Deleuze here in a way that is kind of uncomfortable um, but I guess it's partly because it's in a way it's so dated Um hmm. But in it, it feels to me like it's 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 what's what's what is almost emerging and looking in the background here is a conversation about whiteness um, mm. that I think would be if he, if maybe someone like Lewis was writing now would be a very different kind of conversation. Mm. Um, but does this? It, it kind of comes into what I was you know as scheduled to begin with first, which is this concept of the secret. Um, and I guess that this secret that Deleuze is kind of picking up on a bunch of times here is this notion that um he says it a few times and i'm gonna i mean i'll never find the quotation when you never you can never find a quotation when you want to find it so i'll have to just try and uh, uh try and remember it off the top of my head but he says something about how you know there's um there's always a kind of a becoming woman or he uses the term like a becoming negro or he has like a becoming 
uh, animal, all of these, you know, slightly uncomfortable turns of phrase. But nevertheless, I think what he's kind of talking about is that uh, unless you are kind of eradicate, you know, that there's no eradicating this other. Even like I think he uses the example with D. H. Lawrence, who I'm probably going to come back to loads tonight because that's kind of also a part of what it really is to me about this essay. Um, you know, Lawrence is obviously not a woman, and he's kind of renowned for being a bit of a sexist. But then Deleuze sort of has this argument that well, there's nevertheless this quite powerful becoming woman in there, precisely because of you know this tension where he's engaging, if not. Um, you know, it's not this... Uh, it actually kind of reminded me of what you were talking about, Sean, about with, with Bataille and why there's no gay in it. And maybe it's because it is quite explicitly heterosexual in the kind of... There's this there's this play with, with heterosexuality, with heterodox thinking, with this kind of, like, this, 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 this sense of probably quite, you know, difficult sense of difference that's being wrestled with. Not in Deleuze's usual sense, but actually... Um, this kind of preoccupation maybe that like well-to-do bourgeois society patriarchal society has just with you know combining differences um and i think that this is partly i think what is also you know the the, the reason that Deleuze is referencing dh lawrence so much in here is that dh lawrence also has his um book studies in american literature um and also, I guess that the other person that Deleuze doesn't mention here, I'm surprised he doesn't mention more, is someone called Leslie Fiedler. Um, Leslie Fiedler's like a, uh, a, 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 a far more um, uh, famous, I think, in the US. He's not really that well known, as far as I'm aware, outside of the US, because he's sorry, specifically about a lot of American literature. But he's one of the, you know, the primary literary critics in the 20th century over there. Um and it kind of becomes most famous because he has this scandalous essay written about, um, I'm not sure if it's Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer. Either way, he kind of has this whole theory that this book about boyhood and, and the coming of age in, in 50s America has very strong um, uh, sort of homoerotic undertones, um, which basically gets is just utterly scandalised, uh, scandalises him in, in that moment, just before sort of the 60s. Um but it's kind of it, it, it's it, it's it's a it's something that follows through a lot of these texts, especially these American texts, where whether it's not whether it's the sort of the homoerotic nature of, of of a boy's adventure, or this persistent relationship that America often has with its racialized others. So there's a lot of um, he talks a lot about, and I think Deleuze mentions it too at some point, um, where that Melville writes uh, Quigue into Moby Dick. And Quigue, the relationship between, um, I'm forgetting names now, um, uh, Captain Ahab and Quigue is, is both, is kind of homoerotic. It's kind of also has this um, kind of, f- it sort of foreshadows that like magical Negro t- trope that we have in a lot of Hollywood cin- cinema. Um, but then the question sort of becomes, it, 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 you know, why? What is it about this presence, this this of the other for this, you know, the white protagonist that is so um, alluring? Why is there always this kind of becoming, the, the, you know, again, it's, I, I'm also aware when talking about this stuff, there's always immediately uncomfortable terms, but I guess because it is always uncomfortable, but I guess it's this, it's this becoming savage, right? There's this... Um, and I guess talking about Australia, it reminds me, this is something that I kind of wrote about in my book about Picking at Hanging Rock. And I know that Mark Fisher writes about this a bit in The Weird and Eerie, where he kind of frames that essay as being, you know, we, we, we can't ignore the fact that these women that go and kind of become uh, or, or unbecome in a way, they kind of, they, 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 they throw off the sort of Victorian propriety of their old girls, girls school and then disappear um, in this sort of, uh, this, this, uh, well, Hanging Rock, which I guess is, I don't think it's mentioned so much in the book, but is kind of an indigenous landmark or has been used for ceremonies. And I guess there's, there's a whole history around um, even recent sort of political tensions around that site and that kind of that um, the mythologies of how we describe ourselves and yeah, uh, in these kinds of landscapes. Um, I guess, I mean, the, the one thing that got me interested in this topic was there's a footnote in A Thousand Plateaus where Deleuze and Guattari point to um, this book called The Return of the Vanishing American by Leslie Fiedler. And Fiedler's book is all about this, um, how actually increasingly in American literature, in around the time that Deleuze is writing, you have this return of 
of um, the Red Man, quote unquote, the Red Man. Um, and I think he uses these terms very specifically that are very much dated and kind of want to even apologize for sort of using them in a way. But I think that there's um, fear that uses them very specifically in that um, it's the return of a stereotype almost, that there's a stereotype here forming. It's not, which is kind of something to say that it's not just um, an eradication. It's not, we're, you know, we're past the point of genocide. If these people are going to be here, we're going to acknowledge the existence of other life in this kind of colonial mindset. Then it's like that has that 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 that, that consciousness first forms as a kind of stereotype, and as horrific as that is, it's like it's I think for Fiedler it's the beginning of a kind of reckoning, um, and he starts his book by quoting from D. H. Lawrence's studies in American uh, classic American literature, and Lawrence writes, "The moment the last nuclei of red life break up in America." then the white man will have to reckon with the full force of the demon of the continent. Within the present generation, the surviving Red Indians are due to merge in, great, in, in, in the great white swamp. Then the demon of America will come, will work overtly, and we shall see real changes. Which, again, the language is, is kind of purposely provocative, I think, because it plays with these, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, knowingly playing with this kind of, the. Um, this, you know, it's it's um, this strangely almost like psychoanalytic turn where it's not just that the demon of America is not just this racialized other, but is actually this secret that's kind of been buried. The secret of 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 white gen of not white genocide, but genocide per per perpetuated by white people. So Deleuze kind of starts up. He's talking about D.H. Lawrence and says that D.H. Lawrence, you know, condemns this craze, the dirty little secret, and this is a quote, which he saw as running through all French literature. The characters and authors always have a little secret on which the craze for interpretation feeds. Something must always remind us of something else, make us think of something else. <coughs> and I think partly what is... Uh, that in the context of Deleuze's essay, it's there's not a great deal made of that. Um, he's kind of talking specifically about signifiers. Um, Sean, you mentioned Bataille in the story of the eye. I mean, I kind of my note. When, I know I knew you were going to talk about the story of the eye, and I'm sure you have more to say. Um, all, all I or sort of kind of wanted to throw in is that Bataille's story of the eye is like an, this kind of obscene Rorschach test. Um, I just think it's kind of how Deleuze is thinking about it. He talks about um, story of the eye, or just Bataille in general, as, as as just being this mesh of signifiers of kind of sexual obscenity. With I mean, I, I always think about in story of the eye. I think it's maybe one of the first um, scenes, almost where it's a woman. The protagonist is watching a woman sort of dip her vagina into a into a saucer of milk. Um, I don't know why that's always <laughs> stuck up out with me in my head, but it is like it, it's the sort of thing that when you try and imagine this scene play out in your head, um, it is just like yourself have you're having a fever dream whilst awake, and I think that's kind of very much the intention. It's like to try and activate some sort of unconsciousness in you um, and bring it to the fore. But I think that that's kind of like that's that's part of the problem that we get when we have this trope in a lot of American literature with the sort of the magical Negro or. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know how that that I mean that that's still a stereotype and a sort of and a, a trope that we see a lot more now. I guess it's probably called something else because um, I really don't want to keep using the word Negro. Um, but um, I think that it's it's almost to say that for what what Lawrence sees and what Deleuze sees is that there is this. It's not so much a secret. There is actually this. You know, in, in a lot of these stories where. Um, characters sort of play side by side it's not so much about the relations are obvious the relation of like especially in sort of like in a, in um uh someone like uh huckleberry finn the relationship between a white boy and and a black boy in that story everybody is already aware of those kind of social the social tension there the same is true of a lot of lawrence's stories where it's less racialized it's more across class barriers um where you know the the the, the scandal at the heart is not is is kind of um it's not dressed up in a kind of load of like psychoanalytic trickery it is plainly just a a a, a, a blunt uh betrayal um of you know of, of certain social standards um which i know that you want to talk about um in more detail sean 
Um, but I guess I don't want to waffle too long, and maybe I already have done, and maybe we can sort of discuss <laughs> some of this, because I guess it's just kind of drawing on from the conversation we've already just been having. Um, but, um, well, actually, maybe, that, maybe that's a point. Maybe there's a point to stop there. Maybe we can, I don't know if anyone has anything they want to say onto that, because I've kind of, I'm very aware that I'm now merging the conversation we just had with what I was going to say, but there's, there should probably be a clean break because I'm going to go off on different, different, focus of focal points of the text <laughs> imminently one thing one thing that does come out come come to mind again there is um what you were saying there how in french literature in its um things stand for other things and 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 what it's asking for is is to be interpreted to have its symbolism unpacked and for it to, for it, for, for it to be psychoanalyzed uh, essentially but yes that's it but in, in contrast what uh, what Deleuze finds at least in uh, anglo-american literature is uh is, is surfaces is where it's not about um unpacking the symbolism the symbolism of these things to try and find the um the deeply repressed freudian traumas underneath but just kind of like the open happening of things mm. the event all occurring uh, of things rather than their um rather than them being kind of like all jj abrams mystery boxed <laughs> away somewhere and uh I, I, won't, I won't i won't go look uh quotation hunting uh but i know i think but i know towards i think it's towards the end uh he does quite explicitly start talking about you know how he doesn't want to uh you know how how he dislikes how he dislikes as a tendency to not let things stand for what they are mm. uh, rather uh, uh, in, and and to ha- you know that uh, and anyway, and uh, again just thinking of um, thinking of naked lunch for instance um, you know there's um, I mean obviously symbolism is something that inevitably occurs in writing and there's nothing inherently wrong with that but you know a lot a lot of naked lunch you know it is just what it says you know there's not mm. there's not some kind of like uh, and it burrows actually and um, no, I will, I, will, I will carry on with this line of thought, actually. And, you know, Burroughs, you know, sort of, like, famously tries to efface his own role as author, so you can't even try to m- unpack symbolism by reference to authorial intent, because uh, not so much with Naked Lunch, but kind of Naked Lunch, because he denied remembering writing that book, because he was so out of his skull on uh, heroin at the time, mm. uh, that he, he denied having any recollection of what was actually, of, of the process of writing it, and, you know, and and, what, and, ha- and it kind of like, and the text itself was kind of like formed out of this kind of like greater mass of um, stuff that he'd written during um, his addiction. Well, and a lot of it was letters that someone else went through and picked out the good stuff for him. <laughs> and uh, I know, obviously, and he, and he says as well, famously, that um, Naked Lunch should be written, should be read in whatever order you fancy. And and obviously, with his uh, the Nova trilogy stuff, which I haven't read actually, um, which when he uses um, Brian Geisen's cut up technique, more expli- um, um, th- you know, this is even more of a strike against trying to ground the text in the author's own intent because the author is actively trying to sabotage mm. any intent that uh he might have had um i saw i saw um a a few years ago now i was about at the um, the bryson festival um a genesis p Oridge poem called uh, no gender being cut up by a member of the by a former member of the temple of the psychic youth uh, over the course of sort of like a lecture about um throbbing gristle and then they're turning it into a cut up and reading it and uh uh yeah that's just purely tangential i don't know why i mentioned that actually <laughs> but uh <laughs> oh god remember places and things <laughs> um the uh just, but yes so and i think that uh you know obviously that's all it's all extremely delusy in that you know so and uh and also maybe very derridean actually sort of like you know um well very but well, it's very Let's just say it is very French. You know, this is maybe one of the ironies here, actually, about, you know, so like Deleuze is striking at French literature, but a lot of the, um, what a lot of people, including myself, have found to be sort of the most useful and innovative ways of thinking, thinking about writing, including Anglo-American writing, has come from French theory rather than French literature. Mm. And uh, I, tw- I tweeted this, I stand by it, you know, I very much, you know, sort of like, I think I do hold to, you know, sort of like the superiority of Anglo-American literature over continental literature, but definitely the superiority of continental theory over yeah. Anglo-American mm-hmm. theory and philosophy. Um, that um, 
<laughs> yeah, I remember actually. I God, I was. Um, I went to university. I did my master. This is purely tangential, but I did my masters at um, Sussex a couple of years ago, and I had the I had the the misfortune of being taught by Kath, Dr. Kathleen Stock. Uh, the, 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 ty, the tyrant queen of turfdom herself and this was this was before and i don't know if she had public stuff about her, her her turf shit out at that point if she did i didn't know about it this was before like i i knew about that before like the the big stuff kind of started splashing around uh a bit but i remember like here and and and, and uh she she only talked she taught me for philosophical research methods but um i do remember hearing from people that she was sort of like t- doing some kind of like analytical like philosophy of fiction which did just sound like the most delibidinizing possible approach <laughs> you could have to, to to comprehending fiction uh and i don't and I, I maybe it's very good her theories maybe that's the one good thing she did i don't know i didn't read that i've not read it or studied it but i do just remember instinctively feeling that sounded like where where, where fiction would go to die <laughs> 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 but the um but yeah no but the french theory um and obviously so like Deleuze and derrida are the ones i and bartes are the ones i have most have in mind here have like given us so many tools for deal for like looking and thinking about and doing writing while trying while while uh, resisting kind of like these interpretative um psychoanalytic or pseudo or, or pseudo psychoanalytic arboreal sort of approaches to comprehending texts i think that's yeah i, I guess that's it, you kind of reminded me of where the thread that i lost when i initially started speaking <laughs> and it was like i knew i was going somewhere else. i was like oh, i didn't actually end up going there i went somewhere else um but no, because I think that's a really, it's a really important, like, I don't think it's its even necessarily an irony, like, um, because I guess that part of maybe what fascinates Deleuze and a lot of people about America, at least in this kind of, like, uh, sort of turn of thesis, front tourism, front tourism, frontierism, front tourism is probably actually, that's more <laughs> like the Baudrillard Disneyland thing we probably got going on. Um, we're gonna have to write that down. That's probably quite nice coinage. Front tourism. Uh, it's probably, that's probably that's your next book. Anyway, right there. No, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, where am I going? Um, it's. It, I guess that everything that's been kept in mind is that the Deleuze is looking at essentially European. Well, other European authors, they 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 certainly have European ancestry, and I guess maybe the point is that. You know, it's it, it, what is America if not sort of the world's fugitives, which you know, which includes maybe sort of the 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 the, 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 the French uh, who who kind of got away, and it's and I guess it's a question of you know what are they fleeing from? Um, what what is America if not England persevering? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I guess that that I mean that's it's it's I guess that that's part of the tension too. Right? It's like somewhat true, um, but also uh, this is something that he sort of says right when he's talking about. Um, oh God, uh, you know, I, I I had an analogy um, that I kind of hated. I kind of hate wrote it because <laughs> I've been um, I've been and I don't know if this might even even be lost. So I'll cut it if. Uh, if this is going to fall on at least deaf ears here, but have you seen? You've, have we seen Game, Game of Thrones? Um, oh yeah, We've, some of like, it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not gonna. Okay, I was gonna say I don't want to like give spoilers. I mean, it's been a while, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, the, yeah. Like Game of Thrones is like that's before times, like mythology <laughs> now. Like no, that that's like deep cultural memory. Like there's no chance. It's like spoiling the Bible. Like it's... right. <laughs> well, sure. Well, I guess that like I mean, me and my girlfriend are rewatching the entire series in lockdown because we kind of just. We, we've, I, I don't know. I feel. Good God, that's where you've ended up. Wow. Yeah, truly. I mean, we're, we're gonna we're gonna stop before the last season. But anyway, we've just kind of been. We've, I can't. Which season we're like coming into season six. Jon Snow basically has just been murdered by the men of the Night's Watch, um, and and it kind of like uh, we just seen that episode last night, and it weirdly resonated with reading to us. But um, there's this thread throughout the chapter about betrayal, um, and I think that the one thing that Deleuze is kind of picking up on that's not this, it's not this east to, or west to east frontier thesis that we're kind of. You know, the, I think generally in the 20th century, by I don't know if it's by the point that Dawes is writing, but the idea that the frontier, you know, we, we went from to the Wild West, from the East, has kind of been refuted. And I think that Deleuze kind of talks about this a few times where he mentions, you know, it's, it's, it's about the North, South, East and West. We can think about America as being 
um, you know, the, that we, we've got uh, immigrants coming up from the south, from, from South America. We've got immigrants coming from the north, from Canada and that way. We've got the Europeans coming in from the east. And there's obviously everybody that was already living in the west. And mm. it's not to say that I think that what he's kind of affirms in various places, not just in this essay, but I guess a lot in The Thousand Plateaus too, talking about patchwork. And um, I think he mentions patchwork a few times in this essay, this kind of patchwork subjectivity. Um, the, the American psyche, the American consciousness and unconsciousness is kind of this, you know, the, 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 the red man stereotype, the, the, the indigenous people of that country are a kind of national unconscious for everybody, um, which proves a problem when what happens when you're the unconscious of your own sort of, you know, the, 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 there's this sense that I think um, when when Lawrence is talking about the, the last nuclei of red life breaking up, I guess what is happening in this time in the in the 20th century in Fiedler's writing is that um, 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 native populations and indigenous peoples are rediscovering their own cultures in the sense that they're not now being taught about themselves from the perspective of the other. And mm. I guess that that's kind of this this tension that runs through a lot of what he's talking about anyway. Game of Thrones. Um, <laughs> when Jon Snow gets gets murdered by the Night's Watch. I kind of was thinking about it because they're, they're, he's like, as this, he's, he's, a, he's a bastard. He's kind of in this world, bumbling around, moving from kind of place to place, being sort of cut loose from the family that he's technically a part of, but not really. He goes to Night's Watch, but he's always adapting to a new world. He keeps taking oaths and he keeps betraying them, but always in an attempt to adapt to a new world. And the thing that kind of struck in my mind is that when he's stabbed by the Night's Watch and sort of just left on the ground in front of this board that says traitor, um, as Deleuze sort of says, you should always be a good traitor. <laughs> he's kind of, his betrayal is that he lets the wildlings from the north pass through their gate that they're supposed to be guarding so they can escape this undead horde. And it's weird that the reason that they kill him, like uh, Jon Snow portrays his oath to welcome in a new world, which is for life, but he is killed because he isn't hasn't done he doesn't he hasn't preserved the old earth, the old world, which, if it if it was to be preserved, would lead to the death of everybody. So it's as if to say they choose absolute death over life with a bit of you know adaptation, and I think it's that kind of betrayal in the way that like you know Deleuze is kind of talking about, where it's not just about European betrayal. But every kind of subject from North, East, South or West that comes into America has to betray their origins. And that is, you know, that's what he, I think he says when he's, he's sort of saying that, um, I mean, Arya Stark's probably also another example. She has her whole like subplot where, where she's like gives herself over to the many faced God. There's plenty to be said about faciality from uh, Plaza and Plaza in there, surely. <laughs> but she, she le- and again, this is kind of, it's in the episode we watched last night, but she learns, she, she goes and kills someone that's like, she, she can't let go of her own she can't let go of her life she can't let go of who she is she can't let go of the name Arya Stark she kills someone that she's previously had a grudge against and then she gets made blind and Deleuze kind of just you know basically it's like he's having a kind of talk with Arya it's like you know she has to create she has to you know one has to lose one's identity one's face in it one has to disappear to become unknown Arya Stark has to become a girl who is no one um clefted with you know the 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 european fleeing to america who has to let go of um their precisely their europeanness and i guess it's probably partly the same thing with australia i guess in in i mean again i don't want to speak for you Corey. i guess i'm gonna start projecting stereotypes but you know that there is i think there's that there is this sort of like at least here in the uk i think maybe we sort of have this strange rivalry we we are aware that Australia was like a former prison colony. We're aware that we like basically co- colonized America and then had a bit of a falling out. But we kind of see like as like children that we've birthed, like nation as like state children are like these like other nations. But actually, it's kind of like this weird. It is this weird sense of superiority. When actually, what's superior about Australasia and North America? is precisely that for like you know getting you know losing the the european identity losing the british identity and forging something new mm. i think it's that kind of frontierism that like uh that, that deleuze especially really admires 
um, which isn't limited to the American West, but I think at least how, what I think is interesting is how culturally prevalent that still is. Um, we still have West, we still have like Westworld is kind of a, again, I kind of had a whole chapter on Westworld in my book for that same reason. It's like, we have this perpetual image of, of the frontier that lingers over us culturally. Mm. Um, and I guess the question is why? And I think it's partly what Deleuze is explaining here. Um, which has kind of been, I know we now should have been a minute, but it's kind of been sort of lost. Like, there's this, I have, I have a whole rant that I should, I kind of feel like I should just bottle because I'll just get a bit too irate about things. But that's sort of, <laughs> there's, there's, we already have the stereotype of like you know, the, uh, Americans who, who, who flee America to come to Europe to find themselves again. Um, at the, of uh, this kind of, you know, there's this, this upper middle class, or I don't know, their class system is very different to ours, but it's 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 a thing <laughs> and i think for for Deleuze it's kind of the wrong sort of betrayal right it's like if you if you are if you're an american you should embrace that sense of fugitivity and i guess it's that fugitivity that all americans also have in common not just white americans i was actually listening to a a podcast with um, nathaniel mackey and fred moton earlier today um who were introduced as both these two black theorists who are you know all their work is is is, is this a, a, a poetic exploration of what it is to be fugitive, especially as a black man in contemporary America, um, and their work's amazing for that. But um, you know, it's 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 in that sense, you know, yeah, I think that Deleuze's language and references are pretty of their time, uh, pretty lacking. <laughs> but I think you can follow that. You, I mean, pr- appropriately, you can follow that sort of rhizome that 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 through into these different places, into dif- different subjectivities. Um, and I guess that maybe to bring it around full circle and to, and to <laughs> pass off again, is that what reminded me of that path is when you were talking about Burroughs. Um, I actually started reading Barry Miles' biography of Burroughs called Call Me Burroughs. And it starts with um, Burroughs in a sweat lodge um, with doing some sort of ayahuasca ceremony. And he sort of frames Burroughs as this person who's not just fleeing. He's an American, uh, a white American man, who I guess has that fugitivity in his blood almost from having, you know, European ancestors. But he talks about Burroughs as being someone who's wholly uncomfortable in his his own skin. He's always kind of like his his whole drug taking and everything that he does is kind of this fugitivity towards a body without organs, which kind Mm. of is this, the thing that Deleuze talks about in this text, right? He talks about like um, Kerouac and... Hemingway's alcoholism, or maybe not hero, uh, I don't know. Anyway, all this, all these different, the, the, all these fugitives in, in in modernist literature seem to either you know kill themselves quite purposefully or um, otherwise through addictions. Um, and I guess Burroughs is like just a very high functioning example in that regard, a proper avant garde who can sort of f- far more sustain his old self destructive tendencies, but precisely mm. because he knows what he wants to escape from is is his self. Um, and I guess that's probably why Burroughs is also features quite frequently in a lot of Deleuze and Guattari's writing. But um, mm. that's a very roundabout way of, yeah, um, I've been talking for far too long, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, will ju- I will just um, break in here. Please do. Just, just to, just to uh, b- balance Game of Thrones out with a another co- with another t- telly reference, but to uh, good TV, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is... Uh, we were all like Game of Thrones an example of the bad kind of betrayer where it betrayed all of us. Um, <laughs> yes, the, so uh, true, yeah. true, true, but no, true. It's, it's actually what reminds what, what it reminds me of is a very a very good kind of um, exploration of these tendencies and these tensions in 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 American cultural life in American life is is in Mad Men, which is one of, which is um, uh, one of my favorite TV shows, and there's there's this uh, was, was my, uh, uh, mild spoilers, but again, this came out like ten years ago, or whatever. But like you know, because the you know, Don Draper, the main character, the ad executive, uh, is not actually Don Draper. He uh, to I, I I actually can't remember the, his his real quote unquote real name, but Don Draper was the name of his like commanding officer in Korea who was killed um under fire and he just kind of like and he knew that he's like that don draper was going to get out of korea in like the next couple of weeks so he just swaps the dog tags so they just, it was just the they just stole prince of Whiskiner's origin story from the simpsons <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> yes yes they did but there's a but one of his subordinates uh who's trying um in um 
in Sterling Cooper and the ad agency he works at who, who hates him and wants to you usurp him, Peter Campbell, who's very, very proud of his identity and of his colonial lineage. You know, like the Campbells can trace their their lineage all the way back to like the uh, to the eighteenth century, that kind of thing. Uh, while Don Draper is a man who doesn't even have his own name, you know, stuff like he is totally rootless. And and Campbell finds out about uh, Draper's past. And he attempts to blackmail him, and Draper and like Draper just has none of it. And um, so the two of them go to see their boss, and Campbell tells him the whole thing. He says, "You know, all the investment is not who he says he is," and he, he gives him the whole story. And his boss just looks at him and says, "Who cares?" Uh, and that's <laughs> uh, which is which is one of the best moments in the whole series. Where like he does just sort of like he's just flat out told, sort of, like, who, "Who gives a shit? If he's not who he says he is. This is America." Um, <laughs> and the and yeah, but and there is this um, yeah, and there is this kind of confrontation of these two of these kind of like two white Americas. Um, these two Anglo Americas here, where sort of like, well, you do have you know Campbell, the you know, the arboreal Campbell with his obsession with his roots, and his insistence on like propriety and um and the you know this kind of aristocratic lineage that he possesses, because uh, America obviously America has its own aristocracy, uh, while Draper is totally rootless, uh, is totally rhizomatic you know and and is and is very much like a character from like uh from the beat you know with his with his substance abuse with his alcoholism um which which like runs through the whole course of the story whole course of the story and like these different like literal literal lines of flight he goes on over the course of the of, of the tv series as well for various different reasons uh oh mad men's really good that was the that was the show i watched during the like the start of lockdown just did mad men again and it was fantastic um yeah so i i guess the one thing i wanted to say about the secret maybe is that um it, it's it's a very brief mention in this chapter really this essay um it's there's this strange tension really in that um when Dulles is kind of affirming well I think as Sean have you as you've already said in a way that that, that, that there's nothing really to hide. I think Dulles talks about the empiricists, right? And it's like that there's well there's no interpretation. As if to say that the secret as the sort of signifier is that there's um you place two things next to each other, um and there's this third, there's the, the connection between them is sort of the thing that you can puzzle over and analyze, and it's kind of like it's the one thing that I think maybe maybe gets taken for being a work like criticism. Like I feel like the, it's the one thing that you're guaranteed to find on like a critical reading of a film on YouTube from some uh, wannabe bread tuber will be. <laughs> um, this and I don't know some sort. Of, it's like it's just this kind of like armchair psychoanalytic shtick um, of like so and so did this and and they did this and there's subtext here. Let's talk about subtext. It's all subtext. Um, and the guess that the problem with that is is that you kind of you can do that so much that you actually lose the text itself mm. um, that you're actually dealing with. But um, I guess that the tension in Dulles is talking about this is that this lack of secrets has kind of come to bear in the in the wrong way um he's kind of foreshadowing i guess we're talking about burrows here this kind of like this this the and even bataille in a way where it's all everything's on display it's kind of prefiguring um post-modernity in uh and and, and and i was actually reading um sadie plant's book the most radical gesture on the situationists um, and kind of wanted just to read out this quote that maybe kind of counterposes a little bit of what um, uh, Deleuze is saying here. And maybe he goes on, I mean, I know we're going to talk about um, uh, lines of flight. Um, maybe this, that there's something to be, a discussion to be had about how so, this, the lines of flight that Deleuze is engaging with here have kind of been curtailed by, I don't know, our own cultural development. Anyway, I'll, I'll read this and then pass over the baton. But um, Sadie plants talking about the postmodern spectacle. And she says, the spectacle must be believed. It has no mysteries, no secrets, and no underlying realities. Nothing is concealed, repressed, denied, or turned against itself. There is nothing to be repressed, alienated, or separated. And mediations no longer stand between the subject and the world, but circumscribe all meaning and reality. Baudrillard defined postmodernism as the characteristic of the universe where there are no more definitions possible. 
a world in which everything has been done and all that remains is to play with the fragments, playing with the pieces that is postmodernism. The pieces mm. with which the postmodernist toys are the theories, ideas and vocabularies in which the remains of the lost modernist belief in the possibilities of process, progress, liberation and meaning remain. Postmodernity is a game with the vestiges of what has been destroyed. This is why there are post. Uh, history has stopped. One is in a kind of post history without, which is without meaning. In a doubly ironic reversal of the situationist's argument that the choice of life over survival allows for the free constitution of situations on the ruins of the modern spectacle, Baudrillard characterizes postmodernity as the attempt to reach a point where one can live with what is left. It is more a survival among the ruins than anything else. And I think that that's that just stuck out to me reading for something else earlier this week that um, for all of the what's so attractive about Deleuze's writing on lines of flight and and the secret this this kind of this 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 denial of the secret this portrayal of the secret um, is that kind of that's come back to bite us in the arse a bit. Um, uh, there is this doubly ironic reversal of what Deleuze is talking about here, and maybe that's partly what makes him so contentious maybe for a lot of people in the present but i think there's something here to be in especially in this essay that uh resonates through all of the postmodern noise but um i don't know maybe if Corey, you've got something to say on that in what you're uh yeah um <clears throat> maybe not if if that doesn't set you up very well do ignore <laughs> it <laughs> i just talking about postmodern noise just sounds too too smart i don't know what you <laughs> i don't know where to pick that up no i'm like I did have a bunch that I wanted to say about the line of flight um, and some things that I picked up related to that. So like the uh, line of flight would be the central idea of the essay. And uh, even before Deleuze mentioned Joseph Conrad, I was already thinking about Heart of Darkness and then because of that, Apocalypse Now as well. Um, And the anabasis that is represented in each of those stories. Uh, Anabasis means inland march, but in these examples that inland march parallels an inward journey toward, you know, the heart of darkness, the titular heart of darkness um, that's inside the the narrators themselves. Um, And I think uh, like that journey into madness uh, kind of uh, lines up here with what Deleuze is talking about because he refers to the line of flight as a sort of delirium. Um, And there's a quote that I really liked. He said, um, There is something demonic in a line of flight. Demons are different from gods because gods have fixed attributes, properties and functions, territories and codes. They have to do with rails, boundaries and surveys. What demons do is jump across intervals and from one interval to another. And I like this image of the the demon as a trickster whose influence, uh, like maybe you have to embrace the demonic influence and embrace the chaotic um, if you really want to take the line of flight because otherwise you're going to be stuck on these maybe, you know, modernist, you know, stuck within these modernist boundaries. Um, Perhaps that's, perhaps that's my link. (laughs) Yeah, I guess it's, I mean, it's interesting that you, you make that link actually because i guess the the one thing that heart of darkness always brings to mind for me is that the ccie talk about with the i guess the, the ccie's version of a line of flight is a kurtz gradient named after kurtz obviously from um from heart of darkness mm. but yeah i guess it's the um it's i guess it's that danger right that the line of flight sounds so attractive but it is so difficult to kind of you have to i guess he talks about that a bit too right like you always have to you have to ward on line of flight you have to ward off its own process almost you can't make the line of flight become habit otherwise i can if you went i guess that if that if the line of flight is modernism the postmodernism is you just line of flights in this big knotted tangle and that's kind of where we are we've got no secrets left but none of those secrets are active um, yeah if, if, and if i guess I, that's I will, the sorry yeah go ahead yeah we'll just interrupt briefly and read uh a quote from the essay uh, what is it that tells us that on a line of flight we will not rediscover everything we were fleeing? Mm. In fleeing the eternal mother father, will we not discover all the all the Oedipal structures on the line of flight? In fleeing fascism, we rediscover fascist coagulations of a line of flight. In fleeing everything, how can we avoid reconstituting both our country of origin and our formations of power, our mm. intoxicants, our psychoanalyses, and our mummies and daddies? Um, which really, which really, cuts to the quick of it, doesn't it? The, the um, for the line of flight, there's no the line of flight is nothing is guaranteed on the line of flight, mm. including 
uh, flight itself, including escape, is not guaranteed. Mm. And uh, you know, maybe maybe this is what we can can see. maybe this is what we can see in our conversations about colonialism here. That you know, because you know, sort of the um, you know, like for example, with what is celebrated normally, celebrated in Thanksgiving in America, you know, sort of you know the uh, the pilgrim, the pilgrim fathers, and all of that who were. You know the, the myth being that you know the story is that they were you know fleeing religious persecution in uh, England, and you know in their flight from from that uh, they arrive at um, you know eventually they arrive at the witch hunts and as well as their participation in the genocide of the of the uh, indigenous people uh, that the line you know the line of flight does not guarantee. The, the line of flight from tyranny does not guarantee you against becoming a tyrant. Mm. And again, you know, sort of Kurtz, um, Kurtz is a colonist in Heart of Darkness. Mm. You know, he, he's he's an ivory, he's an ivory trader, and uh, and Kurtz of Heart of um, Apocalypse Now is, um, you know, sort of like it's like although as, as weird as things have got, like it is still just that, like he's figured out how you win the Vietnam War. <laughs> <laughs> like, so like um that is still the thing that's gone on there. That is like the thing he has arrived at for all of his ritual and his violence. It's sort of like, guys, I've done it. I've figured it out. I've got it now. This is how America wins. This is what is this is what is necessary. Well that, that's, that's a crude reading of it, but yeah. No, but uh, I think it's true. Like it's the I guess it's the, the part of the, 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 the if there is a secret, the secret here is that um uh, I mean and it's in everything too, right? Heart of darkness. But look, I always think of one flew over the cookies nest. Um, when at least especially the film, like when Jack Nicholson is left branded at the end, and it's ch- it's the chief who breaks free. Um, I feel like there's this lesson in there that you know that as, as much as there might be all of this explicitly white mythologizing of of, of fleeing our bourgeois European sensibilities, um, we always just end up following the true fugitives, whether that is the indigenous people or. Or especially, you know, or or, or 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 black communities, they 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 lead the way. They're the they're the true fugitives. We're just left always wanting to be like on a becoming fugitive, always mm. just following in their sort of their 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 um, uh, following the the, the 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 in their wake, I suppose. Well, yeah, there's um, a, an interesting thread in the essay about that where he talks about uh, the English language and the way that it is kind of taken up by minority groups, and I think. He, you know, he wrote this essay. Was it the end of the seventies or the end of the eighties? One of the two. Um, mm-hmm. But even back then, he recognised that um, black culture was being like deterritorialized and reterritorialized by the American mainstream, and we see that today. Like any uh, like highly popular bit of slang that has shown up um, in the last few years has pretty much come out of either black culture or queer culture or black queer culture. And yeah, that was something that Deleuze um, recognised in his essay. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, like part part of, for me at least, because one of the things this does kind of sort of like partly reminds me of is, uh, just despite my you know ambitions with, with starting this podcast, yeah, I, ultimately I'm not a Deleuzean though. Is the thing like as much as, <laughs> as, much, as much as I as love Deleuze and as much as I get from reading him and I get a lot from reading him, like. Um, I don't know. Like I, I, I think I think speaking for myself, I am actually quite arboreal, all the same. And I think <laughs> I think there is a, a like, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, sort of like Deleuze is not being a good historical materialist with with, with this essay, with his analysis of America in, in many ways. And um, you know, I think there is an extent to which there is this kind of a. Uh, I'm not comfortable with the denial of history. Um, that uh, maybe he isn't doing that. I don't know. Um, but but like, what comes across at least as a denial of history of his kind of like valorizing of you know killing mummy daddy and uh, heading out across the line of flight, uh, not no longer turning towards the past but into the future. Like part as uh, part of me as attractive as that as that as that sounds. All the same, a lot of me does just say I don't think that's possible. I think history is. I don't think that's what history is. I think that the past is actually far more deeply rooted into the future than any mm. line of flight into the future uh, could hope to achieve in its, in its cutting across it. Um, and I think, yes, yeah, and this is, and I think this can be sort of demonstrated in kind of like what, what you were both just saying there with the inevitability of the, uh, uh, the, the white heterosexual cis subject sort of like trying to pursue a line of flight, but the only kind of like options left open to them being... Um, 
attempting to become fugitive, but, but that's in following the actual historical lived realities of minority populations, of fugitive populations. And you, all over this, you can see like the shadow of real histories, pr like cutting off, like foreclosing avenues for the... Um, for the what for you know, for the white heterosexual cis subject, uh, while obviously simultaneously foreclosing avenues for the minority, while also disclosing uh, avenues to them which simply aren't av aren't available to the to the mainstream uh, um, to, the, to, to the mainstream subject. So yeah, so yeah, so, yeah that's uh, that's something that uh, I had there. Mm. I think it's I think it's maybe there's there's. It's part of the tension here, though, too, right? I mean, maybe less so in this essay, actually. But I think there's a lot of... You know, maybe that's something to talk about, that there's... Uh, I'm kind of grateful that this is such a clear read because there's a lot of resonance still with a geology of morals, I think. But I think there is that mm -hmm. tension between that French... The way that he describes the French way of doing things, where you're kind of always looking for an origin, which obviously has a lot of... I mean, it's you, that's, that's, that's Rousseau, that's, that's psychoanalysis in general, um, that's... Uh, um, Foucault, um, you know, a lot of these uh, very power, you know, worthy analyses that come from that search for for a sort of starting point. Um, but I guess it's how you balance that with nevertheless having a thrust forwards. Like, how do you? I guess part of the struggle is how to have a double articulation of the two. And I feel like Deleuze kind of almost pivots between things. Some essays, it feels like he's kind of he's exploring that that origin in a kind of anti oedipal way, right? It's like it's not so or, or um like you have to it, it's it, um i think he says it more in the in the in the in the logic of sense it's not about denying your birth but kind of betraying it in the right way like to have you know you have another birth you have your carnal birth and then you have another birth into something else um and you can you know because you, you can never get rid of your origin but what you do with that knowledge maybe is something else and i don't know it's it's not it's not really a very clear thought at all but i do feel like it's a really interesting tension that you're drawing on mm. yeah and uh I was, I'll, I'll say one last thing on this particular thread because i want uh because cory I, I know you have stuff about writing and i really yeah. want to get to that because <clears throat> uh, because you're a writer of fiction and neither matt nor myself am uh but yeah um i maybe there's the extent to which like what's going on here is uh or what we could take from this is that um, the relationship one shouldn't have with one's origin is that is the, is this determinate relationship with it where one where our origin totally and clearly uh, defines everything about about us. But maybe what I want to, uh, or maybe what I see as being the case, is more um, it's more that the past isn't done with us. Then it is that uh, the past determines us that the part that mm. the past that history is an active player um on the field uh and is not something that um you can't just cut your line of flight away out of it uh and and you know the thing is i think to an extent this is how that's how i understand the h word hauntology that <laughs> um never you know the, you know the figure of the ghost of the revenant is the past making itself present again um and having this confused breaking down of the distinction between presence and absence and between present and past and future that the at least for me for like the haunt the you know, sort of like the, the hauntological obsessions make it often feel to me that it is the materialization of history and the past and the ghostly into the presence and they're announcing that uh and you know this is the classic thing that the ghost is is that which has unfinished business that the past's business is not is not done with yet mm. and uh yeah and and, cont and, and continues to act on us and, and yeah and I, i've been i've been <laughs> on my lunch break i've been watching um the, the new adam curtis series in bursts and obviously there's like so much of what he's very very good at and i have my problems with curtis but um uh, 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 so much of what he's good at is just kind of like is this act of excavation and this revelation of the reality of the past and the present mm. and the, the past's continue you know sort of like and, you know <clears throat> contra land contra contra nick land contra meltdown you know uh, not that um you know not looking for evidence of the future's um impact of the f future's influence upon the present but the past's continued influence on the future um yes but those are some closing closing 
uh, ha- little hand grenades I chuck at the listener there to, uh, to <laughs> think about because uh, Corey, I want, I really want to uh, throw back over to uh, you here. Uh, I really want to hear your stuff about uh, your stuff about writing. Yeah, um, yeah. I think part of the curse of being a, a fiction writer is that you do view absolutely everything through the lens of um, writing fiction, including uh, yeah, Dulles. Uh, so that's why I like this. A lot of this um, essay really worked well for me because Deleuze is writing about writing um, and then when he's uh, when that's all caught up with these ideas about lines of flight and becoming then it starts to read to me as like sort of a uh, writing advice or maybe writer advice advice to help you think like a writer or even to become one the the writer hyphen becoming um, so I'll open with a quote because uh, I think it summarizes like the ideas that I wanted to delve into um, and he says It is possible that writing has an intrinsic relationship with lines of flight. To write is to trace lines of flight which are not imaginary and which one is indeed forced to follow because in reality writing involves us there, draws us in there. To write is to become, but has nothing to do with becoming a writer. That is to become something else. And again, he... (laughs) He said, to write is to trace lines of flight which are not imaginary. And I just wanted to linger on that because uh, it seems kind of fundamental, really. Like, I write science fiction, so of course I'm writing things that are entirely imaginary. Um, But at the same time, they're really not because as I'm writing, what I'm trying to do is root them in something real so that I can bring those characters and their world to life. And maybe I don't always do that for the reader, but when I... When I do it for myself, then I know that I'm on the right track. Uh, like, for instance, I can't even think about the the closing chapters of my novella trilogy without like getting getting a little bit teared up because it's the end of the story for these characters that I created, and they're not just characters that I created. Like in my mind, they are people, and I care about them really fucking much. And that might sound weird to someone who hasn't like spent years of their life working on a on a creative project, but yeah, they really do become something much bigger uh, than the imaginary. Um, so perhaps they started off imaginary, but like they're very real to me now. Um, and I do remember someone asked me if I was going to write more books in that series, and my first thought was that like those characters deserve a break after everything I put them through, like those poor people. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, like the last part of the quote. <clears throat> Sorry. And he says, to write is to become, but has nothing to do with becoming a writer. And I think a lot of aspiring or new writers struggle with the idea of becoming a writer. They think that uh, like the writer identity is, uh, it's like something that you have to earn and they don't know exactly what they have to do in order to earn that. Um, So one interpretation of what Deleuze is saying here is that through the process of writing, one becomes it's not the it's not the becoming writer that you should concern yourself with because like in as far as I'm concerned you're a writer as soon as you put pen to paper or finger to keyboard um, but the act of writing starts like potentially an infinite number of lines of flight um, because writing means seeing your thoughts your ideas your prejudices and all the rest coming out on paper and it gives you a chance to to see them and to think about them and to deconstruct or deterritorialize them and reconsider them in a way that could help you in that becoming you know becoming whatever it is that you're supposed to be becoming whatever it is that this writing is pushing you towards and i don't know if that's what Deleuze is saying um I don't know if this is an essay on self-actualization through the act of writing, but like it's just something that I took from from the essay. Um, and there was another bit that I really liked. He says, The great and only error lies in thinking that a line of flight consists in fleeing from life, the, line, uh, the flight into the imaginary or into art. On the contrary, to flee is to produce the real, to create life, to find a weapon. And I really love that last bit, to find a weapon. Um, like whether the weapon is your mind, your voice, your persistence, your community or something else, um, you're going to need a weapon if you have any chance of getting through this life of following your, your um, line of flight and becoming you know, the person that you truly are meant to be. Um, yeah, so I think like writing... Oh, sorry. There was, uh, yeah, one last bit that um, another part just uh, that kind of ties into um, 
the first chapter of uh, a thousand plateaus and also uh, geology of morals um he says uh yeah, sorry. With the, the talk of becomings, I think Deleuze is arguing that writing without purpose is not really writing. Um, he says, in writing, one always gives writing to those who do not have it, but the latter give writing a becoming without which it would not exist, without which it would be pure redundancy in the, power, in the service of powers that be. And I really latch onto that because I think, um, you know, you can easily just write stuff that supports the status quo um, but, you know, like, yeah, I think that would be the easy way out. That would be the lazy way out. Um, so like writing doesn't stand alone. It's a part of a rhizome and you can just support that main thread, that arboreal thread, or you can split off into something completely other and completely your own. Um, but then the other side of that is, uh, like writing or the book as an assemblage is not complete until, that writing has been uh, deterritorialized and re-territorialized in the act of being read. Without forming that connection, it's redundant and lifeless. It's, it's, it has not become yet because it needs to become in someone else's mind. Uh, elsewhere, he calls writing the means to a more than personal life, and perhaps he means a public life, um, but I think it's more likely to mean a, a communal one because writing is indeed a great way to find and build a community as I've found in science fiction and as I'm sure that Matt has found with his blog and um, the kind of connections that he's formed through that avenue. That's so, it's so affirming. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> glad that you brought that in. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I was actually like, I, I, I don't know if you find this, but I, I actually got asked, I got a really nice email from someone today where I think that, especially when you write and you write, in public, which I guess all writers do, I guess that's partly what I think. Like that moment, that, that quote you're picking up on, where Dulles is talking about writing, you give you give writing to people that don't have it. Mm. Is the kind of all writing is done in public. Um, but yes, yeah, sometimes like I'll get emails from people that like, well, you know, how do you, how how do you start a blog? How do you how do you start writing? And I always remember. I don't know if maybe if you've had this as well. I remember the first time I wrote an essay for like I was asked to do it was for my old uni, but it was like in a someone else asked me to write something for them, and I remember from that moment I was like I really enjoyed that, and I started adding writer to my CV. I didn't write <laughs> I didn't I didn't write another thing for two years. Um, <laughs> I just totally like fell out of the just it wasn't part of the habit, and then as soon as I actually started doing the blog, I didn't I wasn't thinking about being a writer at all. It was just it was just like something to do and it's it is strange how it does fit with your or it doesn't doesn't fit with your identity almost and it's something that i always thought about with um mark fisher's blog stuff his his the way that he writes about um i think it's a post he has about spinoza actually which is i think probably worth mentioning because Deleuze talks about spinoza a bit in here too um mm. but mark talks about blogging or blogging under an alias like k-punk um, as being a way to, you know, yeah, get out of his own face. That it's it's not really about um, what is. It's not about him. And I feel the same way about my blog in a way. I don't know if that's the same for you in writing fiction, but it, I don't. I don't identify with Xenogothic at all. I okay. think people often like people have said to me if you well I mean I identify with it but I know people that have said to me in in that, I, that I've met in Meat Space they'll be like oh you're you're not really like I thought you'd be on your blog at all you're <laughs> like you're actually really jovial and like just d completely different it's like and I always used to think that was really funny but I feel like oh, but of course like of course I'm not my blog of course that that the, the probably the image that's conjured up of, of of anonymous writer from just reading that is totally different to who I am and it would have to be I feel like if I just wrote me as this kind of ego I figure it would be totally different and I feel like the whole joy of writing is actually being able to get out of that yeah like I I think in some ways I made a mistake publishing everything under my own real name because like I don't have any place on the internet where I can be that anonymous, faceless um, person who's just you know writing stuff with no connection to it. I, I do feel, yeah, like I don't have that distance between myself and my online persona or my writer self, um, except that I'm very quick to pick up ideas and then just drop them. Like I've got essays that I wrote, you know, three months ago that I don't necessarily agree with anymore. But you know, at the time, well, totally. it was an interesting idea to explore. 
that's that's the whole that's the whole that's why I think blogs are great. The whole reason that the, the whole reason for writing more blog posts is just to bury the ones that I don't agree with <laughs> from last week. That's how I think about it. Um, but yeah, no, but I think again, that's but that's I don't think that's necessarily a a bad thing, right? To not not to say that everyone should have an alias, but actually, it's probably better to to not have one. That actually, it's Corey J White that becomes the mask almost, and that mm. and that in itself is probably actually f- closer to what Deleuze is entertaining, maybe because you've got there's no secret there. You don't have that. You, yeah. It's 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 you, but it's also not you, or it's or it's 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 I guess yeah, as he's talking about the characters that you've created. Um, that they're not you, but are you in a way like they're they're or or you know they're you're trying on different masks. I mean, you've written those, yeah. you've written that into being, but it's so you know it's it's also another life, um, a life. I guess that's another essay of Deleuze's on pure image. He talks about a life as a life that's made impersonal, and what is a you know a, 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 in what is philosophy they talk about conceptual personae. That whether it's not so much that you know um, uh, a concept for a philosopher should be like a a character for a fiction writer, and even to say that there's probably not actually any difference between the two. One's just got pretensions of grandeur that the other doesn't have. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that's a really lovely way of thinking about this sort of stuff. Um, mm. Yeah, I, one, one like just small point I was going to make actually was just. Um, uh, I've been taking a creative writing uh, class these last few weeks. And one of the things that's really kind of like impressed on me is, um, and this is only kind of like tangentially related to what you you guys were saying, but I think I think it's an interesting interesting point of the same is how um, the process of like taking a class about how you write creatively kind of like acts to demythologize the um, the fit the image of the writer and emphasizes kind of like the productive like or you might even want to say the machinic nature of the writer mm. of writing in that uh uh writing is this because and it is and it is you know your bourgeois and ideal this is the image that we often have is that the writer is, is the writer is him or she who is struck by genius by inspiration and then the words just flow out of them i want but if you actually like um go away and take some classes or read some books about writing one of the things that you realize very quickly is writing is a skill it is a craft mm-hmm. which you can be taught and can learn to hone and get better at mm-hmm. and you start and you can actually be be taught how to write a story how to write a story that that functions and works and and delivers what a story ought to deliver in order to successfully be a story and even stories that don't follow those those patterns like the classic five act structure or whatever like they still um they still kind of need to be like grounded in that in some way or another in order to depart from that and be and be structured in a different novel kind of way uh and that's that's one of the things that's yeah and that's just something i've liked i don't think that's that's not really what deleuze is talking about this so much, <laughs> but i think it is still a, a, a good deleuzean uh, uh point here that um it is machinic it is productive and the machine can get better like it can it can be it's, and, that's not, and, it, and it kind of democratizes writing as well like mm. if you do kind of like emphasize the fact that so like the reason why not everybody is a writer or not everybody has written a novel is well most people don't get a chance to and like often lots of different like factors like material cultural social factors have to converge in a particular way to give you the opportunity and the know-how to do that but it is still it is still a skill that in principle anyone can pick up and and learn to get good at Hmm. yeah when it comes to publishing i always say that there are three things that you need and that's uh talent uh hard work or perseverance um and luck and so you only need like a lot of one or the other <laughs> like you, no one has no one has all three in abundance but you only need one like either you get lucky and but you've still got to do the you still got to do the hard work because you have to have written the thing to get lucky with and then you have to have like at least a little bit of talent because you've got to be able to put words together in a way that resonates with someone um, but so some people have heaps of talent and then they will never get published because they just don't have, you know, the luck. Or maybe they've got the talent and they've written one thing that's really brilliant, but they haven't stuck with it and honed that skill over, you know, years. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the way I think about it. Um, 
because yeah, I, I won't deny how much uh, luck played into my getting published. But yeah, I suppose that that's becoming in its own right, isn't it? I guess it's um, it. I, I think. Well, I think that's it's maybe something that's kind of left unaffirmed sometimes in this, um, in a lot of writing about Deleuze, as if to say that lines of flight are just things that you're sent off on like a kind of you know you're you're fired out the end of something and you ricochet around a bit um but i think that's kind of the one thing that simmers underneath here is that there is there is a sense of you know you have to commit to it um it, mm. it's it, you, you even you know even even the kind of randomness that a line of flight seems to suggest you have to commit to that kind of um i guess it's like a more aleatoric sense of i don't know approach to life even um, you have to be willing to enter into encounters, and that's something he writes about a few times. That I really liked that he kept talking, using the word encounter, um, mm. that seems precisely to be that kind of luck, right? But even when luck knocks at your door, you have to be ready to seize it. Um, there's, yeah, there's a lot of life lessons I think buried under there in that regard. Yeah, because Deleuze in another part, I think Sean might have quoted from around about this spot because it sounded similar, um, but Deleuze said, a true break may be extended in time. It must be constantly, uh, it must constantly be protected, not merely against its false imitations, but also against itself and against the re-territorializations which lie in wait for it. And yeah, I, do, I think that um, kind of supports that notion of, um, you know, it being a long haul, it being a journey, it being, you know, hard work. Um that you do need to protect your line of flight if you ever hope to get anywhere at the end of it. Yeah, it's, it, it's, um, it's even on the very first page, it kind of reminded me that, he, he, kind of even more succinctly. And I guess it's kind of interesting that he does, he kind of just make this point repeatedly, but I think I remember even there's like a bit in the middle, because it, it is kind of a long essay that just drag on a bit, um, <laughs> I found anyway. Yes. Um, but he kind of says at one point that actually you know, repetition's kind of needed. You kind of need to hammer stuff home sometimes. Mm. But I guess it's like he says that the quote that you've sort of said seems to resonate with a, the, something on the very first page where he says um, about where is it? Um, uh, fleeing to flee is not to renounce action. Nothing is more active than a flight. Yeah. Um, which I yeah I just I love that I love that whole I mean it's it, it feels more like it feels I kind of prefer this like the this the this this notion that is kind of more. Um, kind of has been conceptualized and trying to rigorized by a lot of black theorists in the US but this notion of fugitivity feels feels to kind of grasp that a lot more a line of flight i guess it comes more from this aesthetic i think he's um he he uh, draws on uh, Wilhelm Voringer um who i think he writes this book called i think it's empath abstraction and empathy is one and another is the um, form in the gothic um but he talks about like this kind of the line making that Deleuze kind of draws on even more in his book on Francis Bacon, this kind of very decisive line. Um, but I think that visualizing that's almost not not the the ideal way of putting it, as if to say that like it's like it's just it's purely representation. But actually, a word like fugitivity, I think, really grasps the the active nature of what you're embarking on when you do yeah when you when you undertake a line of flight hmm. shall i uh sort of bring, bring us to a close by going into my indulgent bit about the bible please do <laughs> yes go on yeah <laughs> um right but i mean so this is uh oh god this doesn't really connect too sort of like well with what we were just talking about actually this is kind of like we're going going back a little bit to uh the discussions uh, what we've mentioned already about treachery and uh, and, and and betrayal but um but one of the things that i wanted to that, that's predictably maybe stood out to me it's some sort of like throwaway remarks Deleuze makes about the old testament here where he mentions uh i'll, I'll read uh, a few little quotes here um there was always a uh, betrayal in a line of flight not trickery like that of an, orderly, of an orderly man ordering his future, but betrayal like that of a simple man who no longer has any past or future. We betray the fixed powers which try to hold us back, the established powers of the earth. The movement of betrayal has been defined as a double turning away. Man turns his face away from God, who also turns his face away from man. 
And later on, uh, and slightly further down, uh, God who turns away from man, who turns away from God, is the primary theme of the Old Testament. It's the story of Cain, Cain's line of flight. It is the story of Jonah. The prophet is recognisable by the fact that he takes the opposite path to that which is ordered by God and thereby realises God's commandment better than if he had obeyed. A traitor, he has taken misfortune upon himself. The Old Testament is constantly crisscrossed by these lines of flight, the line of separation between the earth and the waters. And slightly further on still, um, the Old Testament is not an epic or a tragedy, but the first novel. And it is such that the English, um, and it is as such that the English understand it as the foundation of the novel. The traitor is the essential character of the novel, the hero, a traitor to the world of dominant significations and the established order. And so, what this got me thinking about was is is um, reading the Bible, reading the Old Testament as a, as, as literature, as as novel, uh, mm. because I, because I've been. Um, slowly and i've not i've not been looked at it for a while actually i've been so slow i sort of set myself the ambition to sort of really read the uh the hebrew scriptures from uh start to finish um recently and i've, I've only i've only got through genesis and exodus um after, uh, after having decided to do that but i but I'm, what i'm doing is reading uh, a new translation uh of of, uh, of the tanakh by a jewish scholar called uh robert alter and what's really interesting about what about Alter is his background is he's a, he's a Hebrew scholar, but he's also a professor of comparative literature, of, of comparative world literature. And so there's this emph- so his approach to his translation has been kind of twofold. One is to he wanted to produce a translation in English that accurately reflects the poetry and like the 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 um the resonances and like the rhythm and like the artistry of the hebrew original uh while also through like truly voluminous uh footnotes like the footnotes almost always take up more of the page than the actual book than the actual text does. <laughs> uh like truly voluminous footnotes sort of like grounding it in uh compa- you know sort of like a comparative literature and history and like grammatical and semantic studies uh like talking about the like the text position in like context of the greater canaanite cultural milieu and so on uh which is all absolutely absolutely fascinating and it has this uh, effect of kind of like um estranging the text from the reader because this is a novel translation um the and because uh like game of thrones you know the bible is one of those <laughs> very very familiar stories that we all are but we all we all know like the broad stories from 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 from, from scripture and so reading it in a fresh translation is a really, really good way of kind of like having and being able to approach it again for the first time almost and and and, and, pre, and being able to appreciate it as a text. And one of the things that stands out when you do this is realising the Old Testament's actually like really cool and really weird. <laughs> um, it's like there's a lot of like, like if you allow it to sort of like just present itself to you as, as a piece of world literature, uh, there is so much just just like good reading uh to be had there and the text itself is also again like thinking about what we were talking about earlier about sort of like effacement of authorship and obviously this is a tad blasphemous but obviously like if to say that the bible does not have an author um it is it is a it's a mongrel text it's composed of all of these redacted pieces of writing that um like scholarship has identified four major sources um, for the uh, for the Torah, which are um, the, which are called the Yahweh, the Elohist, the Deuteronomist, and the Priest, and, and these like different uh, strings of te- or, or, of um, that run through the text are reflecting different uh, pri- or, like priorities for different audiences. Like the priestly source, like puts a lot of emphasis on sort of like uh, correct ritual and explaining sort of like why the temple has to be built this particular way with these dimensions and all of that and with like the the, the Yahweh and the Elohist you get kind of like different cultic emphases about sort of like God and the covenant and what these things mean and so you have what you actually have in the Old Testament is this kind of like polyphony of all of these different voices hmm. that have been redacted and like there's been attempts by sort of like later authorities in the history of the text and the history of the Jewish people to sort of like 
flatten it into the recognizable Torah uh, uh, and Tanakh as it is today. But the um, but there is still that there, like, and you get, and this like reveals itself in really interesting ways. Like, there's almost these points, especially in Genesis, where the text feels like it's stuttering, um, where you have, for example, like there is three different, like it's all worded in different ways, but there's but Ab- the covenant between God and Abraham is struck three different times in different ways, and like there's but like what and um, one version of it, the covenant of the birds, like involves the um, uh, Abraham splitting several animals down the middle and forming kind of like a pathway between the two of them uh where and he stands on one side and it just says and like god is standing on the other side so uh, you have like this echo of this like anthropomorphic vision of the deity there Hmm. and a blood pact being struck between abraham and god and and like and also explains that sort of the the sacrifice of the animals this was this was a way that a deal was struck in the ancient kind like cultural milieu because like and what it symbolized it or stated was uh if we break our bargain then may we be split like these animals are it's very very strange it's very dark and then you have these other versions of the covenant story where instead of this meeting of two peers in this blood ritual almost it's like it's abraham on his knees and god appearing like beatifically as this authority uh, to whom like abraham is um uh to, uh is abasing himself so and so that's what and you get all of this that makes it so fascinating but the um and this and there's definitely something that feels quite nietzschean about how Deleuze is bringing out specifically the old testament here because in nietzsche sort of like infamously sort of like talks about yeah you know, oh i can't even remember the quote exactly but it says something like uh you know sort of like um the the uh the gospels he has to handle holding gloves because he's frightened until he'll get infected by their you know moral <laughs> by the moral moral diseases within <laughs> but the old testament is much is is much more fun and greek um uh, and and it is like it is a lot more morally ambiguous like it is not always clear like contra the pseudo analyses of the new atheists and all that like it is actually like by no means clear that you are meant to be morally siding with a lot of the main figures who actually appear in this text like lot for instance with the destruction of sodom and gomorrah like infam- you know, there's the infamous offering of his daughters to the uh, to the to the the crowd so they don't rape his male guests so he said we'll have my daughters instead and what Alter points out here is like saying that uh like th- you know we're not we're not meant to think lot is doing something good by making this offer like that isn't what's happening here like no like the plain reading of the text is probably like accurate to sort of like the true meaning of the story that lot is actually like massively shit for doing this <laughs> and is punished for it like his daughters like because he makes the point of his daughters being virgins and then once they escape from sodom and gomorrah into the caves above the mountains his daughters then seduce it's horrible it's a weird dark weird m- moment but his daughters get him drunk and seduce him and rape him essentially multiple times saying but so like we have never known the man to so let us know our father and and also says this is like it does feel like if we're just re- again if we're reading this if we're reading this in a novel like we would know what this meant that this is lots comeuppance for having putting so little value in his daughter's lives that this is that they do this to him and but uh going off on a tangent here a bit oh no, so i'm going to sort of like bring it back a little bit but um so but to the figure of the traitor because um like, like, I talk. A, can I talk a little bit about Moses? Because Moses is, is again, like this classic figure. Like how, how uh, Deleuze states it, sort of like the prophet has to run, has to run from his destiny in order to fulfil it. And Moses is, you know, sort of like a, is, is, is not raised among his own people. He's raised among the Egyptians, uh, and then he kills one of them. He kills the Egyptian guard in the, uh, when he sees him abusing a Hebrew save, slave, and he has to flee from his land in order to have his have to for the theophany to happen for his encounter with with God in the burning bush. Uh, and even and even then, there's something like really fascinating about the fact that Moses uh, Moses himself stutters. He's just, he 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 has uh, he he states himself as being slow of like like heavy of tongue and slow of mouth or something. And so so he so he cannot speak for himself to his people but it's Aaron who does this it does this for him and and um and there is this kind again there's something that feels very delusing about that kind of figure that's all like that uh the you know the prophet the murder of prophet who's run away from his own people and literally cannot even like speak to them properly but he's that there's a brokenness to him 
Um, but but so like wrapping this up a little bit because I because I know this is quite tangential to what we've been talking about, but this is just like getting the things that just like stood out to me. Uh, it's a little bit of creative analysis here on my on my part because like <laughs> like Deleuze talks about, Deleuze talks about the Old Testament here, and like I said, Nietzsche, and again this feels very Nietzschean, and this but it did get me thinking about so like what figure, what kind of like betrayer figure like that is there in the new testament and like the obvious one is judas but like that's not who i'm gonna, gonna talk about but so i was trying to think about this and especially because like judas is just a baddie like there's no kind of like redemptive line of flight uh to judas but the so the like what got me thinking is like in terms of just like an actual like insight into someone's personality the only figure we have like that from the new testament is paul uh who indeed wrote most of it um of an enormous part of it uh, and Paul feels a lot more like if you reconstruct his biography he feels a lot more like one of these Old Testament heroic uh, prophet traitor figures than, than Jesus does who is again this is a bit blasphemous in, ter- <laughs> who in, literary ter- in literary terms as a character is not tremendously interesting uh, I, I, I'm sorry he isn't that, isn't that isn't the point of the gospels like that's that's not, that's not that's not what's happening with them but paul on the other hand is actually a very very you because we get so much insight into his psychology is a very very interesting is an interesting guy and does feel like very very old testament in lots of ways because he is a traitor uh because like for him the like the great conflict uh and, and obviously nietzsche write, writes about this in his own ways and uh and i know that Deleuze did had did write an essay about paul which i didn't get around to reading before this but yeah, you know, Paul's own sort of history is is one of come of is one of betrayal um, to his own people, where he begins as uh, as an agent of the authorities, persecuting the early church and and uh, calling and uh, and overseeing executions, and having this yeah you know, the, the Damascus Road event, which completely alters his life. But also like and and you can like use the Deleuzean language of being set on the line of flight here because he's mm. he has never settled from this point onwards. His life is just a a, 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 a like a rampant journeying around uh the world from that point onwards. And it is him becoming traitor to his own people. That is what he becomes from that point because he, he betrays the law you know the law which he tells us and the traditions that he tells us he loves so much. He has to betray them because he realizes that the only way he can truly fulfill them is to become a traitor uh is to become a traitor for christ and i think if you look at that like, paul's language here he does become a very Deleuzean figure because there's this sense where he his be- but there is this like curious emphasis on becoming that's that is quite subtle it's definitely there where there is this decup like the whole world is kind of like being decoupled for him now like he's re- like as he has he is now turning against all the established powers that he used to represent and it's put very famously in uh in in corinthians where he talks about like i you know where he becomes all things for all men it's like as 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 to those under the law I become one as one under the law to those without the law i become as one not under under the law and there is this sense of like dis- like like this sense of becoming in discovery for paul that he has in his becoming in his becoming traitor to his people uh, for the sake, uh, if it is for the sake of a more true relationship with with them, in a sense, of of it, it, it was a, a treachery which was commanded by his old loyalties, uh, which he sees fulfilled, which he sees fulfilled in Jesus, and the and and the only way this becomes real for him is him becoming everything to everyone, and all of the old boundaries on his life uh he discovers are no longer there or they're only there if he needs them to be there if he sets them up again if he needs to and then he can take them back down again so there is this that's what so paul is a fa- is such a fascinating figure for me because he is because you see we see so much of his psychology there uh in his in his in his uh, in in his letters and in his figuring out of himself through them, and what well, and again and and thinking about this in terms of writing, what's fascinating here is that Paul, for a start, like again, like again, like Moses, and I guess again, this makes him feel sort of like oddly Deleuzean is that he tells us that he is not a good speaker. He can't like he's not an impressive speaker. He he's not good at this, and has even again there's been speculation that he might have 
stuttered or, or had a speech impediment of some kind. But what? But so he turns to letter writing instead. But again, what makes it what's curious here is that for the world in which he lived, to to write a letter is to dictate a letter to a scribe. Hmm. So there's his writings are much closer to a speaking than a writing, which and you can see this if you know to look for that. You can see that in the in in the text because they are they're very discursive and they kind of like drift around a lot in the same much like this monologue uh, <laughs> is is jumping all around the place, is flowing around in different directions as he pursues these different avenues of thinking. Uh, as, which is him which is him trying to catch hold to the point whatever point it is he's going for so you do get really like, these moments of contradiction or these moments where he kind of seems to in a single uh letter seems to like vacillate on a particular point because this is his his working out of it almost um yeah i'm just gonna stop there though like I, i'm just gonna sort of bring back to a, bring that particular line of fight to an abrupt halt as i noticed the time and uh <laughs> but I, and also because i did not like have this like a firm conclusion in mind. These are just some things I did want to throw out there, because uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, the of this this project being all about the particulars that speak to us individually. Yeah. Um, yes. So, do we have any concluding thoughts, buddies? <laughs> um, there is this one this one quote that I pulled out that I thought was um, a very interesting. Um, there is no need for philosophy. It is necessarily produced where each activity gives rise to its line of deterritorialization. So there we have it. It's done. Podcast is over. <laughs> <laughs> we don't oh, need to do I this anymore. I've gone to university all for all those years now. <laughs> <laughs> you had to read this essay first. That was your first mistake. <laughs> but I think that's. I mean, it's it, it is the perfect point to end on almost, and like, and especially that that point around like drawing out the resonances for each of us, and then like seeing how they all hang together. I feel like that's the whole point of the thing, right? Like that's mm. the it's not philosophy with a capital P, but it's the it's the it's the the layering. It's not the it's well what's I mean, what's Deleuze the, I guess that's why this whole chapter's so meandering, right? Deleuze has the whole section on relations and it's and the power of the and 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 even mm. ignoring the and and just throwing them all into the pot and seeing how they just they are together. Feel like we've we've had our i think it's it's been a it, 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 the essays the essays written that way and i feel like we've responded kind of in kind even without really meaning to so <laughs> it feels like a really nice yeah it's a good way to it's a good thing to affirm yeah no definitely well then um i think we should probably just call it a night uh <laughs> or call it or or call it a day as it is for you Corey. yes indeed <laughs> Well, thank you uh, very much for joining us. Hopefully we'll get the uh, next episode out a little bit quicker than uh, this one uh, came out. God knows what we'll talk about. We'll figure that out as we go along. Um, and yeah, let us, let, let us know what, what you enjoyed and uh, we will try to do similar things. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Corey, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at CJ White or at CoreyJWhite.com. Matt, where can people find you? Uh, people can find me at Xenogothic on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Xenogothic.com for uh, the hub that connects all together. And where can people find you, Sean? <laughs> people can find me on Twitter at Hauntonaut and that is more or less the only place you can find me. Uh, do either of you have anything you want to uh, plug? Any things that's happened in the last few weeks you want to uh, draw attention to or... Uh... I wish things were happening. <laughs> I wish, Aww. I wish the this wish, I wish they were events and places. <laughs> Maybe, hopefully, hopefully soon on a future episode, we'll be able to explore our, our, the lines of flight we have out in the world. Or, or Corey, could, we could just live vicariously through Corey the next time. <laughs> you can tell us about what you get up to. <laughs> yeah, you need to like strap a GoPro to yourself. Just like do something like go to a coffee shop and then sit down and have a coffee in the coffee shop. <laughs> Oh, that's that's almost like a, a great streaming idea for people under lockdown. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> Pay me to go out and drink coffee for you. <laughs> VR is an Australian for the day. <laughs> How annoying are our um, accents really? <laughs> Find out. <laughs> uh, 
and until such a time as when uh, I've been Sean, those two have been Matt and Corey, and I'm going to say good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>